Hey there, guys, and welcome back to episode 27 wow, of the NH2A podcast where we discuss anything related to the Second Amendment, including firearms, gear, and current events. I'm your host, Jacob Clifford, and join my co-host, Jared Mitchell. Alrighty, and today we're going to talk about firearm storage and security. Um, but first, some personal news. Nothing too crazy. Um, nope. Well, on one hand, my <laughs> night vision hasn't shipped, but they did get back to me and said they've been just experiencing, apparently, a bunch of issues with their shipments coming in, so... I will say their um, customer service people are top notch. Yeah. I don't know how I can't speak for the warehouse because it just you know from my experience it doesn't seem like it's on it much. But um, but you know they could be getting screwed from their it's, supplier. But I know their their customer service is on it. Like I emailed those guys at like seven thirty at night, and I just forget you know they get me in the morning. They they emailed me back multiple times that night and were explaining to me you know everything that's going on. So that's U.S. Night Vision by the way, and they I will say. Their customer service is on, and I told them that. Like, it almost sounded like they made them to order, though. Yeah, which I, is odd because on their website they show a stock number. That was the thing that got me. I think. Yeah. If anything, their warehouse isn't connected well with their salesman. No. Maybe something like that. Um, but other than that, yeah, like I said, their customer service guys are really, really good. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. like you guys heard, I got mine in. Um, so last week, one evening, we uh, took Salt Pork Six out our our oh, girl range van. Uh, we just drove that under nods, which was awesome. And honestly, a lot easier with a PPS-14 than uh, I've been previously told to believe through the internet. Yeah, it's not it's not as bad as, no. you, as you think. No. Um, I mainly drove with sevens, so I was even wondering, like, it's the eye that's off. Is that gonna screw with me? It's not bad. We took some Gorilla Tape, taped over all the- uh, um, Instrument panel. Yeah, the yep. instrument panel, all the cluster and stuff like that, so that's all. Not blacked out. The only thing we didn't tape over is the tail lights, which yeah, um, we'll probably have to lights. do. Yeah, and reverse yeah. lights. So you put it in reverse, it looks like <clears throat> someone's just shining a light at you. Yeah, you know, it's on. But it's not bad. We both just got in, basically, you know, middle of the night, we just got inside of a 2010 Dodge Caravan and drove around my property in complete darkness. So yeah, that was awesome. It's always a, it's always a weird, weird time on the old, on the old NH2A yeah. property. Yeah, stretched the, uh, the legs on our lasers and illuminators. Yep, messed around them. with those a little bit. Um, yeah. Even checked the, um, so that Surefire 6P that's on my uh, M16A1, that's my 85 gun, um, it came with an IR cover for it, so we just said, you know, we'll just put it on and see what happens. All and, 65 um, lumens. Yeah, oh, yeah, we'll grow. <laughs> um, I could shine a, um, I could shine a fence post that was about six feet away from me, um, and that was about it. So um, I'd like to try it in like really dark darkness, just shits and giggles, yeah. but I'm pretty sure the actual little the little map reader thing on the nods is actually brighter yeah, than probably. the one on my right bolt yeah. the lens. So, um, so pretty cool nonetheless. Oh, either way, it's just neat to see. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we had fun with that, and then we had a little bit of fun with the visible lasers because they're god awful powerful. Um, you know, we're not like the dickhead shining on airplanes, but we definitely could. So yeah, no, so we wouldn't do that. Once Jake gets his nods in, we're gonna go up to the range and zero our lasers, and then we'll do some night shooting from there and fill you guys in. Yep, definitely. Look for an episode on nods pretty soon. Yeah, uh, once we get everything flushed out. Yeah, do a little salt pork six stuff. I wish we could take our salt pork six up to the night range, but that just yeah. make it hard. <laughs> I mean, we could, it'd just be illegal. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, just drive her in nods, turn all the lights yeah. off so the police won't see. Yeah, they won't see. <laughs> just drive her nods. <laughs> uh, um, Something else, um, if you guys are unaware, if you're listening to the podcast, we are live streaming. So just be on the lookout for our live streams. Uh, right now we're doing it through Instagram. I'm going to try to figure out a way to do it through Facebook here soon. Like at the and, same time. And possibly YouTube. Um, it'd, be, it'd be great if we have <coughs> multiple platforms here just to give you guys the most opportunity to you know view us, actually see us in person. And, donate and, us your phones. Please. There you go. And see the, uh, the equipment we have out here. So we have some, some items related to our topic today. Yep. None of which seem to go with each other, but that's beside yeah, the close point. enough. Um, it's all historical. That, that's the, that's the basis right the there. Purpose. Yeah. So uh, as Jake was saying, farm storage and security. Um, so pretty much a, a pretty cut and dry episode, uh, just touching on a few things that should be common sense, but not everybody really subscribes to all the time. Yeah. Um, and I, I can speak from experience taking reports of stolen firearms. Uh, I'll get into that later. And then just some common storage, maybe issues or mishaps people have and not realizing. Yeah. So, so we'll start with the obvious, um, just to store your firearm. You want to store it in a cool, dry place. Um, the NRA National Firearms Museum recommends 50% humidity. That's what they keep their building at for all their, you know, one of a kind, very historical weapons, which yeah. 
we're not the biggest fan of the NRA. I still like to go to the museum in Virginia. So like it's cool. Yeah, it's, they have some really cool stuff. Exactly. <clears throat> but yeah, fifty percent. So what I personally do for where I store uh, most of my farms is I have dehumidifier, and you can set the percentage of humidity on that. So I have it set at fifty percent year round. Um, I know some people actually they have a humidifier and a dehumidifier. Yep. So they keep so the level keep balancing it yeah, out. Yeah, they keep it at fifty all the time. Which ideally, if I had a you know, dedicated gun room, I'd probably do that. No, that'd be, that's a smart move. And basically all I do is I just try to, you know, in the summer, kick my AC on. I turn it a little lower, just, you know, conserve a little bit of power, just get some cool air moving and try to get fans moving around my apartment. It stays somewhat dry up here anyways. Um, but just, you know, because I do display my firearms out. Um, yeah, and most of the time, you're, you'll notice an issue if you if your gun's rust easily. If they rust easy, then obviously you have too much humidity. Exactly. If your wood furniture starts to warp or swell or crack, in worst case scenario, then you know, and you know it's, it's too dry. dry. Yeah. Well, a good a good example is, for instance, at one point I had a Smith and Wesson Model 36 revolver, right? Like a similar, like a you know, like the old like police like police guns, like the Chief Special and stuff like that. Very similar. Um, I had one, and I thought I don't know why I thought this at the time. I was like, oh, perfect, like you know, bathroom gun to keep. Like, in my, well, my bathroom's kind of small, and so it gets really humid after you take showers. Within a week, it was like, like just salt pork. A shotgun. Mean, like, um, so the shotgun's not bad because a lot of that's aluminum now. Yeah, but the AR. Uh, but yeah, but no, this little Smith and Wesson Model oh, Thirty Six. Yeah, yeah. It was you know it's blued steel and it's wood, so that just went to shit really soon. So I had to pull that out and give it some hops and stuff like that. So um, I think your AR even started to rust a bit. Yeah, which was all, interesting. Yeah, so I had to pull that. Parts, yeah. So it's difficult having like a bathroom gun if your bathroom's humid. In which most cases, at least consistently, if you're showering consistently, it's going to be somewhat. Humid. I, I don't know. I don't think most people are going to have a bathroom gun. But yeah, so I just bring the Glock in with me. Yeah, just fight my way to my well, or something. Weirdly enough, my my carry gun, my Gen Three Glock 19, has started to rust. Really? Yes. Which. Gen 3s, from what I understand, have some of the best finishes that Glock ever did. It's, it's actually on the finish? It's rusty? Yeah, yeah. Really? So, I don't know if I just wore through it. Like, I haven't even been carrying it, like, that long. Yeah. And see, it hasn't been a year. So. Yeah. Mine, so what I find is that on my sights, you know, say, like, on my rear sight, I actually had to stake it just to be safe. Like, I yeah. staked a little bit. And where you get nicks on the actual sights themselves, because I think those are steel. Those actually ended up rusting, and then your barrel, obviously. So you'll even notice on a carry gun where you have that salt from your sweat, you have that you know that moisture all day because you know I'm always doing manual labor and carrying, so yeah. it has. Um, you'll see the end of the barrel actually start to rust. So it's kind of the same idea. Your that humidity will rust your firearms pretty fast, yeah. um, faster than you think it will. Um, yeah. Just start with surface rust, and then before you know it, it's going to be pitted enough where it's not going to be able to go away. I mean, you'll see it on a lot of these older service rifles, like military surplus guns. You think these were taken out in the field. And um, use you know, and abuse. Use and abuse, yeah. and so that pitting will never go away. Even if it gets re-blued, you'll yeah. notice that. Yeah. A good example, at some point I'll take a picture of my 1911. It's the same deal. It's, that pitting will never yeah. never leave it. Yeah, so on, you want to stop the rust, obviously, before it starts pitting, because pitting is irreversible. Yeah. If you do have rusting on your farms, a good little pro tip is you can take quadruple lot, so that's four zeros, steel wool, um, and that'll take the rust off your firearm without ruining the finish, ruining the gluing or any of that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, you just use some gun oil as your lubricant and just rub the seal wool on the rust, and it goes away very easily. Yep. Uh, Without a doubt. Um, and obviously, you know, the best maintenance is preventative. Yeah. Um, so, for instance, uh, break, fl- break free, the same people who make break free CLP, they make a, like an antique firearms wipe. And what you do is before you stow a lot of your antique firearms, you actually just give it a good good coating of it all yep. over the metal and even some parts where the metal meets the wood I do anyways and what that does is that that kind of gives it um, it soaks in the metal over time and it keeps it um, you know keeps away from surface rust which yep. is really useful and if you don't do that you can even just take some rem oil and just give it a wipe yep. down of rem oil yeah rem oil does have a long term storage option as yep. well um, and obviously that's what the P in CLP is for so take that into consideration yep. yeah yeah um, yeah there's all kinds of different ones out there. The main thing is just keep it lubricated. Mm-hmm. Uh, a point on historical firearms that most people don't remember is underneath the stock or underneath the receiver up against the stock, uh, which depending on your level of uh, uh, mechanical <laughs> inclination, I guess, you might not want to disassemble your firearms and depending on how complex they are or if it's an M1 carrying, you might, you might actually mess with the accuracy by taking it apart too many times. Yeah. But... Just remember that any part of metal, if you can see it or not, will rust. So just keep that into consideration. Yep. And that's just the basics of um, 
you know, caring for anything that's metal. It's like, you know, around here people oil undercoat their vehicles. Yeah. Because oil, oil yeah. helps metal. Yeah. Um, so, same idea. Uh, next topic, next point uh, would be displaying your firearms. Yep. Uh, so, that's a big part of storage. Um, you know, because you buy these things for their historical value, how they look, all this kind of stuff. Yeah. It, it's kind of a shame just to stuff them in a closet and then, and then pull them yeah. out once a year. You know, and then what's going to happen? What, next time it's going to see the light of day is 50 years when you're dead and your kid's going to go yeah. sell in a gun store, you know? And so it's good to give them some kind of display. I mean, what I, what I tend to do is, and we'll, we'll get some pictures out there eventually, of it eventually, is I set mine up with a few, like, I try to at least historical items of the period. So, for instance, with this Grandis store, I have an old tanker jacket from World War II. I have a cartridge belt. I have like a D-Day letter, like the one that came went out to the Allied forces, and then it's like an old cigarette ad from the 40s, like that shows like tankers in World War II. Yeah. Just re weird, cool stuff that like kind of does it some justice to give you an idea of what what the time in which that was used for. Um, you know, do that and then get some accessories for it. Like a lot of times, like a good example is I bought this Car 98 in January, right before I really started focusing all of my gun money into just training ammo because stuff got crazy quick. Yeah. So you'll notice this. It doesn't have a sling on it, it doesn't have like a bayonet with it. What I try to do is I try to purchase, you know, at least a sling and like the bayonet of the period or some yeah. kind of accessory. Like, um, I mean, you'll see like, it's out of frame, but like my uh, Krav Jorgensen over there. Yeah. Um, you know, it has the sling on it from the 1880s and it has, or 1890s rather, and it has the uh, bayonet that came with it. And so you at least get that so it gives it kind of that full picture. Yep. Put it up with some other cool stuff, like, you know, um, and it, I don't know, it just does it some justice. I have a Canadian yeah. Lee Enfield with a Canadian flag behind it. It's yeah. cool stuff, you know? Yeah, and it's always a, it's a balancing act between proper storage and displaying. Exactly. Because uh, obviously, if, if you display, say, some rifles in the living room, it's pretty hard to keep that, like, the humidity in that room yeah. uh, at a reasonable level and then match that with storage, or, excuse me, with uh, security that we'll touch on later. It's a balancing act, you know? Because... Let's say you have a ranch style house, everything's on the ground level. If you have open windows or open blinds, mm -hmm. people can just peer in and see, oh, he's got a rack of guns over on the side. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something you want to consider, you know. Uh, we'll touch on security in a second, but you always want to have that balancing act. Like Jake lives on the third floor, so nobody's going to just be peeking in through his window. Yeah, you got to be really looking if yeah. you're uh, yeah. seeing stuff inside of my place. Yeah. Um, uh, another, another very... Uh, Baited topic is keep your magazines or weapons loaded slash unloaded. Yep. Um, probably the magazine thing's huge for ARs. Yeah, that's a constant debate. Yeah, a lot of guys are like, oh, you got to keep them unloaded so you save the springs, and other guys are like, you got to keep them loaded so you can actually use the damn thing. Exactly. And that, that's kind of thing is like I think Clint Smith said it once. He's like, imagine having to re every time you want to like put a new mag in, you're basically loading six revolvers real quick. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, who wants to do that? Yeah. And so I understand like. For certain things keeping them loaded but in my opinion for fighting rifles and fighting pistols you should keep loaded mags everywhere that's kind of the point you know what i mean yeah. you're not gonna you're not gonna be wanting to load 30 round magazines in a fight yeah. that's just silly now with magazine springs from my understanding of how they're engineered is the actual compressing and decompressing of that spring is what wears out is what wears out the magazine use exactly it's not the constant tension of rounds in the magazine. I think no. that's a misconception you know, that a lot of people have. Maybe if you go over 50 years, it might make a slight difference. But yeah. for the amount that you're, the service life that you're going to use out of a regular AR mag, especially in today's world, is going to wear them out far quicker than keeping them loaded or keeping them unloaded. Another consideration is metal versus polymer mags for your ARs. Uh, I have heard that if you keep P mags loaded for extended period of time the feed lips will get worn out yep so most of the time it's recommended you get steel magazines or at least steel followers like the lancer magazines now the one thing i have that don't they make the little caps for p mags they did put on that's for long-term storage and I don't, they're not all sold with those yeah they used to always be i don't yeah. think they are as much now but so if you are running p mags it's not a bad idea to get those and put those on if you're gonna have long-term storage yeah if you're gonna use them within the year it probably doesn't even matter yeah but at least it takes that tension off of the feed lips and so it might just give you a little bit more time. But I've even noticed that with some AR mags that may have been just older, yeah. is over the years they'll actually they'll fatten out a little bit. So you'll the notice they get tighter. Ones. Yeah, the yeah. aluminum ones do. Yeah. So that's something to take into consideration. Um, as far as loaded weapons or not, like it's probably pointless to keep like your Car 98 loaded. Yeah, unless or you're, your yeah, M1 Garand. All quiet's on the Western Front, boys. Yeah, you know, it's, 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 it's. But 
Yeah. Obviously, self-defense weapons, they need to be loaded for self-defense. That's the point. And then there's there's certain security issues that you run into that we'll touch on. Yeah. But as far as just storing your weapons, it's best practice if it's historical or you're not using it for self-defense, you might as well just keep it unloaded. There's you know, no... Yeah, and then you have to think, you know, these, these magazine springs are, what, 70 years old? Yeah. You know, 80 years old? Yeah. And so that's something to take into consideration, too, is would you... You know, say you had an original waffle mag to the first AR that came out. Yeah. I wouldn't be lo loading that or keeping it loaded exactly. all the time because yeah. that's an old magazine. Yeah. These metal does wear out over time. You know, you want to be able to take these out and use them. Yeah. And again, what's the point of having a loaded Car 98 if you have, you know, other strategic self-defense firearms placed yeah. around? Exactly. You know? Yeah, there's no need that's to That's just silly. There's no need to keep everything you own loaded. Like, you, what you use for self-defense is one thing. Exactly. Um, Another thing, storage of ammo. Um, ammo, just like firearms, can you know tarnish. It's not necessarily going to rust because of what it's made out of. Yeah, but if it's modern, you know, non-corrosive yeah. ammo. But I know I, like I've inherited some ammo from my grandfather um, that's completely tarnished. It's like completely green and blue, mm -hmm. uh, and some of that surprisingly you just wipe it off. It still works. But mm -hmm. the older ammo gets, the less reliable it is. Um, yeah, old brass, you know, that's what yeah. happens. What I do is I store almost all like ninety nine percent of my ammo in a ammo cans. Mm -hmm. Just keeps the humidity and the moisture out. Uh, helps yep. it last a little bit longer, and it's yeah. just easier you can to take some of those uh, silica bags. Yep. Toss those in. Yep. Um, that can't hurt. Yep. Like you use a lot of meal prep containers for your. Yes, I use for my reloads. Yep. I actually use meal prep containers because you can buy a bunch of them. Yep. And so, well, like um, you know, whether it's just brass or like normally the primers, I just keep in the primer boxes. Yep. Um, but like my brass, my bullets, my um, just other reloading or my loaded ammo. That I've already made, I keep it all meal prep containers over just in stacks because they stack easy, and those seem to do well. You know, they keep it away from other moisture. You know, if you click yeah. them all together. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, well, there was Any other points on ammo? Yeah, on ammo. Um, yeah, just on a like we were saying when it comes to self defense. You know, keep it in magazines. Yeah. Ideally, because you want to be able to use it. Um, and the humidity can go along with that. Now, one thing I'll, as an example is like my dad, for instance. I remember seeing. He has an old like leather, like John Wayne style, like gun belt, um, and he kept. Of course, this was you know back in the day when the Ruger single six was all the rage, and so he has like cast lead twenty two LR that he stuffed in it. And I remember pulling them out one day, and they were just almost just ready to just kind of fall oh, apart. Yeah. So like same thing with firearms and ammo. Don't keep them in like a leather holster or a leather like belt. You know yeah. what I mean? Um, like an old school um, cartridge belt. You know, say you want to store like an old Western gun up. You might not want to keep rounds in that leather belt because they are, the leather really tarnishes brass. Um, or it can if it's stored in there. Or it can rust the actual. Yeah, because it holds that moisture yeah. too. Something um, else, leather stuff. You need to condition it frequently so it doesn't. Yes. You know, crack. Yep. Just like you know, if you wear leather boots, you should like grease them or oil them. Yep. You should do the same thing with your leather stuff, like holsters and stuff like that. Um, put some kind of you know, whether it's even like a shoe grease or like a leather balm. It's good to do that because yep. they will crack and they will ruin. I mean, like my old 1911 holster, the original one that was issued with my 1911 in 1918, um, that one, you know, you can tell she's been used and abused, but she's been greased throughout her life, so she's still got a lot of life left in her. Yeah. Um, that's very, very important. I agree. Something else we kind of already touched on was oiling or, and or greasing your firearms. Yep. So obviously you want to keep them lubricated so they don't rust like we already said. Yep. And the grease the grease is an interesting point. People yep. forget this. And I didn't know this for years, um, that you should be running on old, like, Garands. They prefer grease, right? Like, Plasta Lube is the best stuff that I've found that use, um, use on this. And my 1911 actually prefers it. Um, any of my older bolt guns, Craig Yorgetson, 1903, even the Trapdoor, you know, in places that you would grease it, they prefer grease over an oil, like a CLP. They just seem to run a lot smoother. They don't collect as much dirt. The only thing you will run into is if you're running in cold weather, they're a lot slower. That, that grease really slows down your action. Yeah. So you might have issues, but they, they you, make different thickness ones. If too. you run in a dirty environment, they'll, they'll stick, dirt will stick to them. Yeah, and it's going to not be as reliable, but it's going to preserve the gun longer. So. Yeah, and, it, and it's definitely, I've just found, you know, grease, it just makes the gun run better, yeah. you know. Um, the last thing I've Not for your ARs, though. No, 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 don't <laughs> grease your ARs. That, those are meant to have CLP. Yeah. Um, then they like putting grease in like a like an air ratchet gun. You know yeah. What I mean, like don't, that's yeah. pointless. It was meant to have air oil. But yeah, so that's yeah, definitely look that up and see like what firearm you have and what it would prefer. Because I'm I'm sure there's a manufacturer's recommendation for what oil it should take, and then you know take whatever yeah. discretion you need for it. Um, 
Yeah, and then we already kind of touched on historical displays. You know, give them a little bit of justice. You know, put something cool in there. You know, they, yeah. they made it this far in life. They ought to be displayed and shown off. And, and I just think it's a good way to bring other people into the gun community. People come up to my apartment, for instance, who might have, like, played, like, Call of Duty or something yeah. like that. Like, oh, that's, you know, and it's cool to teach them about something and have other stuff but just the gun there. It shows them how important these firearms were at yeah. certain times in history. Um, but now we'll kind of transition over to, the, you know, the more important side of it, well, equally as important, um, but legally more important, yeah. which is security. Um, so you should be able to kind of structure your security plan from the outside in, yeah. right? So kind of uh, set up multiple levels of defense, um, if you will. And um, so the biggest thing you can start with is get a security system, uh, which a lot of people are going to nowadays. Yeah, um, there's a lot of systems you can piecemeal so you can buy it as you can afford it. So you can, you know, start with cameras, which Coming from a law enforcement standpoint, cameras are the most important aspect because then you can actually, you have the potential to actually ID who stole your, or either broke in or stole something. Um, other important aspects would be like security lighting that you know comes on with motion. Yep. And then you have- Those are very uh, good deterrents. Yeah, security and then you lights. have actual alarms. So if somebody breaks a window or even opens a door when it's armed, um, you can have different sensors in different areas. Then an actual vis um, audible alarm will go off. And that, yep. that's a big deterrent right there. Oh, yeah. And can't hurt to get a dog either. My dog will sniff you before you even get up the staircase. Yeah. They'll sniff you out. Yeah, dogs are, dogs are a good thing. Because yeah. if, if they start barking, then... They start barking, howling, doing stuff like that. Even just yeah. the sight of a dog. Even if they're, like, somewhat sweet. People know that chances are there's probably an owner around, especially if it's night. Yeah. And it, it's hard to... You can hide from a person pretty easily, you know. But, like, even a dude in a ghillie suit, a dog will find you. I don't know if you ever, like... Like, you know, we used to play with, like, ghillie suits when I was younger and stuff like that. Yeah. If there's a dog around, they're going to find you. Yeah. Like, they're not dumb. Um, and so it's always good to, to have, you know, just kind of like those old school things, like you said, like a, like a dog. Yeah. But um, Something else I just thought of, if, if you keep a lot of um, stickers or Second Amendment kind of stuff either around your house or on your vehicle, chances of uh, you get, like, chances of a firearm getting taken are much higher. Yes. Um, and that's, that's why I don't necessarily propose basting my vehicle in like gun stickers you know I put like yeah. an NH2A sticker and there's also a reason we have a minimalistic kind of logo and sticker so it's, yes. we don't want to be loud we don't want to yeah. you know necessarily there's not a picture of a gun it says NH2A podcast a picture yeah. of New Hampshire exactly yeah. you know what I mean if you know you know kind of thing exactly you yeah. know you don't want to have every 3 percenter NRA this and that gun of America sticker yeah. all over the back of your vehicle because someone's like that dude's got guns in there or yeah. if it's parked in a driveway that dude probably has guns in his house Yeah. Um, it was like years ago there was an issue going on I believe it was more out west where um, gangs were actually going around towards gun shops and they would actually put like a sticker, a magnet, or like a little flag on people's bumpers that were visiting gun shops. And then they would just go around neighborhoods later that night and see if they could find their magnets and stickers yeah. again and they would attack those houses. So um, you're already putting the sticker on for them, I guess is what I'm getting. Yeah. So uh, try not to make yourself that noticeable because, you know, you're going to be real cool you got all the stickers but you don't have any guns in your house because I'm stole them all. Um, yeah, another important aspect is, you know, locks on the doors, deadbolts, actual, actually strong doors. Exactly. That's a big thing is, you know, knock on your door and if it sounds hollow, chances are it's hollow. You know, um, yeah. a lot of them are nowadays, especially like if you live in an apartment where your doors are interior doors, um, yeah. they're not as built to not be kicked in yeah. as exterior doors are. Um, so it can't hurt to upgrade your doors. You know, even if you rent to somebody, just put the other doors away and then when it comes time to move, just place the door yeah. again yeah. Um, it's good to have a door that you know locks cool but if it's if you can like knee your way through it then it's not worth having a lock on yeah um, you know and then obviously we move down to a safe you know and depending on who you're living around how who has access to your house and just general safety also you know against fires is a big thing too yeah. it's a good thing to have a safe you know if you have like a big chest safe I depending if you have kids or not I you know, I'd suggest against having like a safe for your, you know, grab like self-defense gun when you're sleeping. Yeah. But if you have kids, you have kids, and you know, you should, as a parent, you know, kind of practice some kind of, you know, safety around them and figure out what what you feel safe having them have access to when it comes to a loaded firearm. You know, um, but you know, they make just a hell of a lot of different safes now. Ones that are very easy to access. Um, if you know what you're doing, you know, what's the ones like you have a certain push code on your hand. Yeah. Like little tiny next to your bed yeah. safes. Um, you know, and so that comes back and forth. You know, you can talk about gun locks, which I'm not particularly a proponent of. They don't really 
do much. Like, you know, they were real. There was a big push for them back years ago, and they just yeah, never really proved to. There's be a very reason they stopped. There's a reason they ship them with just about every new gun. Uh, that's because law dictates it. Yep, the Youth Handgun Act or whatever. Yeah. Um, sometimes those you can find uses for those uh, standard. Um, I don't know what they're called, but gun locks that are kind of longer. Yep. They're more extended. Sometimes those can have uses, like if you're trying to secure a firearm in a vehicle, potentially you can get that around like a seat or something. Yeah, that's um, a, yep, that's true. There are there are there are um, situations where they are beneficial, but if you're like we said, if you're using your gun for self defense, having to defeat a lock and then you're not gonna have fun with that. Yeah, you get shot. It's, it's probably no. not gonna happen. So um, that's why we recommend either have quick access safe or have proper education with your family about no. and regardless you should have the proper education with your family yeah you know and so when it comes to you know you should educate your kids to be safer on firearms we were talking about that we both grew up around firearms yeah. everywhere you know what i mean but we were taught from a very young age how to be safe around them and when you're really young you know not to touch the damn things if you don't know what you're doing you know um leave that to somebody who knows what they're doing yeah um, and as you get older, you know, introduce your kids so it's not a mystery because every mystery some kid's going to try to solve that exactly. mystery. Just They're going to want to know what it is. Think about like Christmas presents. Kids exactly. Come around time. the house looking for Christmas presents. They, you know, they find them a lot of the time. So yep. you they're going to do the same thing with your guns. Ex exactly. You think kids look up to their parents usually. So. If they know dad is always into firearms, they're going to want to be like him, yeah. and they're going to want to like play with firearms too. And they're not going to understand, you know, all the things you take into consideration. So it's a gradual point as they're growing up, you know, and you can gauge that a lot by how mechanically capable they are, you know, as they grow up, you yeah. know what I mean? If they can start to understand simple machines and complex things like that, then it's time to start teaching them more about a fire. Yeah, because every kid's going to mature at different levels. Like, exactly. Like we had Mike on the podcast, I think for his first episode on here, he was talking about how his dad taught him the lethality of firearms by yeah. going out and shooting a squirrel. Yeah. And, and then, a, and then he was like, oh shit, like I know that yeah. like guns are a serious thing. Like Exactly. Um, and each kid's going to be a little bit different. But. And again, and so as a parent, you should be able to identify certain things with your kid too. So if your kid's a little sketchball, right, it's, you know, it's better to be safe than sorry. Yeah. Okay, so if your kid's a sketchy kid, you know, he has issues, and you can accept that as a parent and work towards fixing that, part of that is not letting them have access to firearms freely when you're not around. You know yeah. what I mean? Um, that's just part of being a good parent. And so, you know, judge that based on, you know, how your kid reacts to things, how your kid acts in general. And so, you know, if your kid is very prone to, you know, certain issues, then okay, maybe you should consider more keeping everything in safe. So, yeah, but um, you shouldn't keep the, the gun as a mystery. It should be no. something that is talked about and it is brought up and, you know, it's, it's known that there are certain things you, like when uh, we take on a gun, like, there's going to be parental supervision or whatever whatever you determine the rules to be you need to set those but i think like we're like we're touching on the mystery of the gun is going to be more dangerous than the actual teaching of you know, exactly what the gun's capable of without a doubt um <laughs> and then we can move on to like you know vehicles you know i don't like the big thing that came out last couple of years was um magnets in your vehicle for your pistol mm -hmm. you remember seeing that like yeah um, and I even bought one a few years ago, but now I, I actually use it for my phone, just to magnet my oh, phone yeah. to it. But um, that's the thing is it's like so you're keeping like an open handgun, very clearly visible in your motor vehicle. That's not secured in any secondary way. That's a smash of a window away from use. Um, versus, you know, you should at least try to exercise some kind of concealment when it comes to having a firearm. Most vehicles, especially now, have a locking glove box. They have locking consoles um, or at least have it behind a seat. And then, you know, even if you're running into a store real quick, that means you have to lock a vehicle. That's that's part of being, you know, a gun owner. If you're yeah. a person with a firearm in a vehicle, then every time you're leaving that vehicle unattended, it should be locked. And it should be, you know, away from plain sight. Yeah, like I've touched on the system I have in my Jeep. Um, and I'm very particular about, you know, keeping everything locked up. And yep. I know uh, Aaron... Aaron Cowan of Stage Dynamics has a video on vehicle storage. It's pretty good. And his recommendation is he never leaves a firearm in a vehicle overnight or for an extended period of time of, of the of a weapon being in a vehicle that's unsupervised. Um, I I think as long as it's always double locked, which is kind yeah, of how I do it. It's actually secure, secure. Yeah. So like like I touched on, I have a Pelican case that's locked and it's tethered to my Jeep, and then 
I walk by G. So somebody would have to defeat two walks. And the argument is that if, if a criminal has time, then they can defeat almost any lock. True. So if, if, if you are not seeing your vehicle for eight hours, there is a potential that any lock, no matter how well it is put together, is still defeatable. Yep. Uh, but, you know, there's a, there's some other stuff that goes into that. You know. That's like, you know, but I mean, if you, you know, if you were to leave your house for more than 10 hours, I'm sure somebody can figure out a way to get to your house. Too. Yeah. So it's kind of... I guess the argument is... back and forth. It is. Yeah. I, I tend to just, you know, keep it double locked and leave it in my Jeep. That's what yeah. I do. I would call neither of those points invalid. Yeah. I, um, it's kind of like people saying, you know, use the slide release or, you know, power racket. Yeah. It's kind of yeah. those things like, you know, you use your own kind of knowledge, experience, and opinion to, uh, you yeah. know, form an opinion on that. Yeah, there are some videos of, uh, you know, professional locksmiths getting into safes, like, ridiculously high-rated safes, but they yeah. can get into them in 20 minutes. Yeah. Um, well, like, for instance, gun locks are a joke to get into. Oh, They're yeah. One of the easiest locks to defeat. Yeah. Um, but vehicle storage is very important. I, I recently took a report at the PD of somebody that had their firearms stored in their center console of their truck, but the center console nor the truck was actually locked, yeah. and it was just kept in their driveway. Um, luckily, luckily, they noticed it soon, so it was able to be reported, and then the serial numbers entered, entered into the national database, and if that ever runs across a background check or a gun shop or anything, it'll get flagged as stolen. Still, yeah. As long as it's not used in a crime at that point, uh, it should be able to be returned to the owner. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, it's still, potentially, you are, uh, you are adding a statistic, you know, you're adding a number to the overall situation of gun violence. Yep. Which, and you're you also, know. like, what's our goal not to do? <clears throat> not to arm criminals. Obviously, yeah. so you're hurting our point. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's part of being responsible, being proficient. You know what I mean? That's kind yeah. of part of what we preach here. Is the last thing we want to be doing is um, giving firearms to people who shouldn't have them because it's going exactly. to make us look worse as a community. Yeah, yeah. Because um, odds are, like, if, if the person's willing to steal a firearm, chances are they probably aren't allowed to have one in the first place. Exactly. Otherwise, their chances of okay. committing a crime in which they're going to be using firearm in a violent way are a lot higher. Yeah. Um, not necessarily saying it's 100 percent by any means, but Chances are, you know, they're more willing than a guy who goes buys one at a gun shop yeah. to commit a crime. And we live in a small town, so there's still a lot of older people or middle-aged people that, you know, don't even lock their doors because they're kind of like, oh, whatever. Like, I know growing up, like, we only locked our door when we were sweeping at night. Otherwise, it was unlocked. I mean, growing up, I remember, I think they lock it now, but, like, I remember as a kid growing up, they would leave the front door open because <laughs> it was hot. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. It was like, okay. Lock the screen door or something, just a flimsy like. Yeah, and they wouldn't even do that. <laughs> yeah, like, it would just keep the mosquitoes yeah. up. And so, um, I and just, so you have that generational gap too, yeah. where a lot of people um, aren't even taking that into consideration. You know, it's like they just like I figure, you know, I live in a small town, nobody do anything bad, really. Yeah, we've actually had a lot of, uh, not a lot, but we've had a, a good number of uh, reports recently where people have had things missing out of their vehicles. Or there's another situation where somebody woke up in the middle of the night and saw the dome light on their truck on, uh, and then come to find out somebody did enter their vehicle. I think in both of these situations, nothing major was taken, but like I already said, the firearm was taken in another situation. So we, we are having people that are going around town, you know, testing locks on cars to see yeah. what, what they can so get away with. One thing I'm looking actually to start moving towards is I'd like to set up a series of cameras um, with motion lights on them, yeah. just around like say where my vehicles are parked, um, Maybe even, you know, one just looking down my hallway and just maybe a few like around the house where, and I can keep a monitor that's on when I'm sleeping. So if something does go off, I'm going to notice that it'll, you know, say beep at me. Yeah. And um, I can view through the screen, okay, um, is this a false alarm? Is this something that's going on? Is somebody trying to break into my truck? Or is somebody yeah. coming up the hallway? Honestly, that's, that? that's very <clears throat> smart. And um, so I can keep a monitor right next to my bed. Because that's something I constantly worry about. I'm like, okay, you know, I don't have very, I have visibility. And I have multiple people who have visibility over my vehicles that I trust, but I'd rather have that constant visibility through a camera lens. Um, so that's something I'm going to eventually probably work towards just to just to secure property and to see if it ends up being a bear in the trash. It keeps getting in there, so I'll, I'll get him one of these days. Yeah. Um, but so that's kind of uh, all of it, all things to consider. Yeah. Um, and then one of our final points on security will be insurance, um, and it's something. I've worked towards with like USAA a little bit is um, getting insurance on your firearms, especially if you're like us and our collectors of historic firearms. Yeah, um, some, some sort of personal property it's insurance. A really good idea yeah. because you think you know over the years you have a lot of money yeah. invested in 
um, historical fire, stuff that's, you know, irreplaceable. It's hard to know the value of some of these items because, yeah. for me, it's a lot of them have sentimental value. But on top of that, every year, these guns get older, so they get more valuable because mm -hmm. there's less of them out there. Exactly. And, um, yeah, I mean, look at look at this, how ridiculously, like, Mosins have gone up in price oh, in the last yeah. five years. I bought that for $125, you know? Yeah. Um, and not to say, you know, you should be going crazy about protecting your Mosins because they're garbage rods, but... Um, Regardless, you know, you're talking about, you know, Garands that are going, I mean, Garands have gone up in price. Yeah. Ridiculous. Especially if you have a World War II era M1 Garand, you're probably looking at two grand. He's like, yeah, this is a 1945 Springfield receiver on yeah. this. So, I mean, this one, uh, I believe it was May of 45, so still wartime. I mean, yeah. Um, but regardless, I mean, this this just goes up in price as the years go on. Same yeah. thing with like Car 98s, Craggyorn, stuff like that. You're going to want to get insurance because... God forbid there's a fire or a theft or anything like that, you're gonna be you're gonna be hurting. You know what I mean? You're gonna be without all these firearms that you spent so much money on, um, you know, and then you're just gonna have to rebuild your collection from the ground up without any assistance whatsoever. Yeah. So it's it's a really good idea. And then, you know, when it comes to your value, you're just gonna have to basically um, just look it up online. Look it up, you know, yeah. and there's people who can appraise them for you too. There's multiple gun shops who are pretty good at doing that, actually. Um, like even like people like uh, Boss Man there in Woodsville, they'll um, yeah Bruce yeah Bruce will actually look up that stuff for you. He's pretty good because he's done auctions for years, and yeah. so he, he's pretty good at appraising firearms um, for their legit price. So even if you brought in like a list and you asked him, hey, you know, could you look these up? You know, I don't know if he charged you or not, but either way, it'd be worth getting a legit price for. And yeah. then he could probably even sign his name to it. Insurance company would be pretty cool. I believe that. USAA is pretty uh, based on the honor system for the most part. Yeah. You know, and I don't know how other insurance. I mainly only deal with USAA, yeah. and they're, they're pretty they're pretty good to you. So um, other insurance companies, you know, could possibly be back and forth on. Yeah. So. But you got to think about even your AR. Like, I mean, you have the rifle itself, the value of that, and then you have the accessories. Especially you and I getting into nods. Oh my like, God. We have some money invested into that kind of technology. So that's all stuff that you know. Ideally, we should have insured. Yeah. Um, we don't at this time, but we're probably gonna look towards doing that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, I need to. Another big thing that I, I'm working towards slowly, it's just trying to find the time for it, is writing down an accurate description of everything, every firearm I own, with a serial number. Because that's yeah. another big part of if you get a stolen firearm, is knowing the serial number. That way it can actually be entered mm -hmm. into the database. Exactly. You know, um, and like you were saying, um, before the show, we were talking about how, you know, it's it's actually a really good idea to write a little story of how you acquired it and yeah. where it came from. Yeah, because in 40 because, years, you might not remember. Yep, like yeah. you were talking with your grandfather. Yep. Like, where did this come from? Like, that you know, yeah, mean, my grandfather knew rough timelines, but he didn't know yeah. specifically. It'd be kind of cool. I bought an 80s. They're so like, okay. Yeah, yeah, it'd be kind of cool if you could tell your, you know, your grandchild, like, hey, I got this on this <laughs> date, this gun shop, and, like, this is what, you know, the political climate looked like at the time, or whatever, whatever story you can come up with. Yeah. Yep, and it'd just be, it'd just be neat to, to know. You know what I mean? I, I'd like to see, for instance, like, that AR, like you were saying, bought in the 80s. Like, did you buy it pre-May of 86? Did you buy it post-May of 86? Yeah. Like, I just like, it'd be interesting to know kind of the way the world was at the time. Like, could you still, was there like full autos next to it that you could just buy? You yeah, see, I, mean? I don't it'd know. Be, it'd be interesting yeah. to know. Um, yeah. It's just interesting stuff like that that, you know, other gun nuts will find really fascinating. Yeah, I remember my grandfather, this was for my Colt um, SP1 uh, that I inherited, and my grandfather said, yeah, he bought it in the 80s. He might have even bought it from the Whitefield gun shop. Yeah. I don't remember exactly. Um, I don't think he was 100% sure either. But he said it was like towards the beginning of when you could start buying ARs, when they became like civilian weapons. Easily get around. Yeah. yeah. When they became main, mainstream, which would have been in the 80s, yeah. they were available. Colt had some civilian ARs available yeah, they didn't pretty really, early. But yeah, they didn't really start marketing them to no. civilian market much. Like you could get them. Yeah. But like I remember um, seeing an ad, like, you know, I don't remember because I wasn't there, but like I remember I'd see, seen ads online and like through like historical stuff where old, like, Colt would market the AR-15 to, like, returning Vietnam vets yeah. who would have something on the ranch. It's like, you trained on it, you used it, you might as well use it on your ranch. Yeah, because until recently, yeah. I was under the assumption that they became legal in the 80s. Not legal, but they became marketable in the 80s for civilians. Yes. Uh, but in reality, if you go on the Colt's uh, website, you can actually get um, serial, na uh, serial number ranges for dates of when SB1s were made. And some of those actually date back into the early 70s, if not the late 60s. I don't remember 100%, yeah. but some of the SP1s are very early, and they're around the same time the, the Army was adopting them. Uh, 
So, I, let's see. Yeah, so the main thing, guys, is just keep an accurate vlog. We recommend do it through a cloud, like Gmail, like a Google system, like Google Docs. And just keep an accurate running list of uh, everything you own related to firearms and serial numbers and all that. It's just, it's going to help you if anything, you know, fire, you can claim what you owned. Uh, pictures would even help as well, but fires or thefts or anything like that, it would definitely, definitely be helpful. Yeah, that's very true, Eddie. I see, uh, he was talking about how, um, what he said, or if you become a big YouTuber, Demo Ranch had pistols in his safe that he didn't even know he bought, which is pretty concerning. And it's true, once you get to a certain oh, point. Oh, yeah, you kind of like um, go through your safe and you're like, oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, you know, um, yeah. so you really should be taking notes down and at least, you know, like you were saying, have some kind of backup. Because I started doing it in the Army, um, just mainly for the stuff that I had, when, like where I was stationed, because, you know, it's more after you get stolen here in, like, the city and yeah. stuff. And so um, I wrote it out on my typewriter and uh, had papers like that, you know what I mean? So, like, I, sh I should have put it into, like, a Gmail or something. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, what are you going to do? I think that about wraps up the episode. I think it does, yeah. Yeah, yeah this was a pretty straightforward episode, but we hope you guys uh, got some good information out of it. Um, we're looking at when we can, you know, scrape a little bit more research time together. We're going to be doing some more in-depth episodes. Uh, yeah. We want to talk about more histories of gun control. Yeah, history, philosophy, yep. um, stuff like that. We seem like, I, I personally really enjoy those episodes, and I think you yep. guys do too from what we can see. Um, they just take a lot of background time. Yeah, exactly. Like yeah. for, you know, 45 minutes of talking on here, it takes an hour and a half, two hours right before yeah, to exactly. really set that, you know, it's one thing to research it and know it, but to be able to um, present it in a way that makes sense and yeah. that's, you know, um, well thought out takes time. And so, yeah, so uh, something else we want to talk about is more founding fathers and, you know, their philosophy around liberty and self-defense and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, we, have, we have a bunch of stuff in the works. Uh, we, prior to this, we were talking about ballistics of the 223.556 out of an AR-15. So we want to do some testing on that, uh, figure out what the best round is for, for our use, uh, for prepared citizen, and maybe we'll present that with some sort of uh, modern Minuteman kind of update Without uh, doubt, yeah. as things as things progress. Um, but yeah, if you guys liked what you heard, uh, you can follow us on social media. Instagram is nh underscore 2a, Facebook is nh2a. We also have a Gmail. Uh, a couple of people have reached out to us on there. We greatly appreciate it. Uh, we're trying to set up some guests and some additional comments. Uh, so that's nh2apodcast at gmail.com. And we have Patreon if you want to support us monetarily. Money doesn't go to line our pockets or anything like that. It just goes to help production costs, give you guys better content, more variety, and that kind of stuff. You can support us at, for as little as $2 a month, and that's at nh2a on Patreon. Yep. Uh, personally, you can find me on Instagram at jmitchellante. You can find me at Cliff the Concrete Guy with underscores in between all the words. And if you can't find me and it's that hard, you just wait because I'm probably watching every every live stream because yeah. I, well, I watch it on here. So, uh, uh, yeah, and also for you guys in the podcast, tune into our live streams. Um, it's kind of unpredictable when it's going to happen because we record kind of at different times. But yeah. we always post on the Wednesdays. But, it, you know, we post the podcast up on, when, on Wednesdays. But we don't necessarily know we record. Like right now, what is it? Saturday? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so right now we're recording on Saturday. We've recorded on Friday evenings before yeah. Tuesday. You know, so it kind of goes back and forth. But if you do catch it, tune in. That's probably what the, when you see that we're live streaming, that's probably what it is. And we'll save it to Instagram so you can watch it um, after the fact as well. Yeah. So, all right, guys. We appreciate you listening. And um, on to closing statements. Yeah. We'll go to the uh, closing statements. Let me grab it. Yep. All right, so as always, be proficient, all right? Ammo prices are really high right now, and they seem to only be getting higher. And uh, nods seem to be coming in three weeks after you say it. <laughs> but um, we get out there, train, you know, at least get your dry fire in. Um, there's also, you know, there's programs out there to help you out when you can't get live fire in. If you're bad at something, practice it. All that good stuff. Um, be politically active. There's a lot of people out there trying to take away our rights right now. Um, and it seems like it'll never stop. And the best thing we can do is constantly be on the offensive about that, you know, and get more people into the gun community, be welcoming people, teach those new people in the gun community. Um, and that goes right into being polite. Be the kind of person that the gun community is proud to have you as a member of, okay? Um, just be a good person in general that's gonna reflect well on you and anybody you associate with, which includes the gun community. So again, be proficient, be politically active, and be polite, so. We'll see you guys next time. Take care.
And thank you for the kind comments, Eddie. I see about we uh, lots of good information. Thank you for the podcast, and we appreciate you watching them and commenting. And you know, we're trying to get out as much information as we can. So yep. we appreciate it, bud, and everybody else who ends up watching this, or anybody that did log in. So we'll catch you guys next time.